Good morning. The date is uh, January 23rd. This is the uh, regularly scheduled executive committee meeting in the first of the new term here. Uh, I am joined today by Council Members uh, Gordon, Council President Bender, Council v Vice President Jenkins, and Council Member Johnson. Uh, we do have a quorum. We have four items on the agenda for today. Two are designations and then two are presentations from HR. Uh, the first item on the agenda is uh, designating Nuria Rivera Vandermeid as interim city coordinator beginning February 12, 2018 for a period not to exceed 90 days. Um, I am uh, going to go ahead and make this motion. Uh, is there uh, any, any comments on this particular item? Uh, seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. That item carries. Item number two is extending the interim designation of David Frank as Director of Department of Community Planning and Economic Development beginning January 29th, 2018 for a period not to exceed 90 days. Um, I will go ahead and make that motion as well. Any discussion on this item? Uh, no. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. That item passes. Uh, item number three is uh, appointing a position in the health department as the deputy commissioner of health. Um, also, we'll be adopting some findings that the proposed position meets the criteria in section 20, um, 1010 of the Minneapolis Code of Ordinances, uh, and then approving the appointed position of the deputy commissioner of health, um, evaluated at 590 total points, is allocated in grade 13. Um, I, do we have a, I think it's Rick, it's here to present. Go ahead, yes. Mr. Boaz. Yes, good morning, Mayor Fry and members of the Executive Committee. My name is Rick Boaz. I'm a Senior Compensation and Classification Analyst for the City's Human Resources Department. I'm here with Ms. Pam Nelms, who is also a Senior Compensation Consultant in the HR Department. We're here to ask your approval to for an appointed position in the Health Department called Commissioner, uh, Deputy Commissioner of Health. The uh, Commissioner Musicant is also with us to present additional information and answer any questions you may have. We're here also to request your permission to submit the city's Local Government Pay Equity Act report to the Minnesota Department of Management and Budget as required by the Local Government Pay Equity Act. The uh, department in the health department, the position in the health department, Deputy Commissioner of Health, is um, it meets the criteria and we please request you adopt the findings that this position meets the criteria outlined in section 20.1010 of the Minneapolis Code of Ordinances City Council to establish positions. We ask that you please approve the position titled Deputy Commissioner of Health, which has been evaluated at 590 total points and allocated to grade 13. We ask that you please approve the corresponding salary schedule for the position, which has a salary range of 106,447 to a maximum of 126,186 in accordance with the adopted compensation plan for appointed officials effective January 23, 2018. We ask that you please refer this matter to the city council. This position will be responsible for creating uh, combining the enterprise administrative functions with internal services under one leader and creating a clearly defined backup for the commissioner. To expand on the duties of the position and answer any questions you may have, I'd like to request Commissioner Musicant to come address the uh, committee. Thank you, Mr. Bose. Commissioner Musicant. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Um, so uh, the department is going to experience um, two major retirements this year, our Director of Administration and our Director of Research. And so um, in the name of succession planning, I've been thinking about this for a couple years, have consulted with HR um, over the years, and um, am proposing to create <clears throat> a deputy director, which would then um, combine the functions of the two retiring um, uh, directors and would create two manager positions, a manager of administration and a manager of research that would um, support the work of, of that um, deputy commissioner. As Mr. Bowes said, um, 
The focus of the division uh, would be internal customers, both city um, internal customers and department uh, customers, and it would create a clear backup for me when I am out of town or, or not able to um, be immediately responsive. And I think it also sets uh, the department up for the future with more system and strategic orientation to that work um, relative to our internal services, such as our grant applications, which are very important to our department, our budget, which is fairly complex because of all of our funding sources, workforce development, which we know is um, important for all of us as we think about the future, and integration of our data and research work with uh, new um, IT systems. So I do have a couple um, org charts, if that's of interest to you. Yeah, that's actually really helpful. Let's see, I don't see it up there, there. Um, maybe we can go in a little bit. So um, these are the uh, folks that be responsible to the uh, deputy commissioner. Um, as I said, the manager of research and evaluation, uh, the manager of health administration, and then two uh, strands of administrative support. This is a, an, another org chart, which um, is not laid out the way we lay it out, usually across the page, but um, you can see that the deputy commissioner and the areas of responsibility under that, that position and then the other remaining uh, directors that I will have are down below. Uh, the director of environmental health, environmental programs, policy and community programs, and adolescent health and youth development. So stand for any questions. We have any questions for Commissioner Musican. Uh, Council Member Gordon. Well, first, I just want to say that I'm, um, I know that we've discussed this as, as former chair of the health committee. We looked at this in planning ahead, and I appreciate you coming forward with this um, thoughtful review. My li little question is, um, it says that we will refer this matter to the city council, and typically um, executive committee will refer something to Ways and Means, and I'm just wondering if you would have a preference of where it goes in the council, um, and I'm, I'm not quite sure. If we refer to the council, it feels like it's going to wait till the council meets and they're going to refer it to a committee and I don't, it seems like we could find a place. And I guess I'm saying, does ways and means make the most sense or do you think it's very important that the health committee also reviews this? Um, Mr. Chair, um, uh, Council Member Gordon, it's my understanding that this is the new process, um, that uh, things from the executive committee go to the full council and then the full council decides what's next. Um, in the past, I understand that it's gone to Ways and Means, which would be fine with me. Um, oh, maybe I missed it when we approved the new rules. I don't know. Okay. Um, I probably did. They sometimes uh, try to sneak stuff in on us with those new rules approvals that I'm not aware of. So um, I'm not sure if that makes a lot of sense. That means everything we do is going to take an additional cycle from now on, and we'll have labor settlements, we'll have contract, you know, settlements for... Um, legal matters, and um, I, may, I, I don't know, um, we might want to consider fixing the rules later, but that will take that up at a different point, and I'm sorry to distract us here. Uh, thank you, Council Member. I, uh, Commissioner, I have a couple questions real quick. So this is a, is this a new position, or is this simply elevating an existing position and increasing the salary for it? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, I would consider this a new position um, because, um, and yet at, it will be implemented in a way that will um, <coughs> replace the two retiring directors. And so we'll have one appointed position replacing two appointed positions when they indeed retire with a new position. Okay, but it's, it's I guess it's reducing or at the very least keeping the same the number of existing staff. So in other words, it's not an uptick to the cost. Mr. Chair, that's correct. Okay. Okay. Council Member, Council President Bender. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I know we talked about this during the budget process last term, but I can't remember, was this, it, did we approve this as part of the adopted budget at the end of last term or we were just discussing this position at that time? 
Um, Mr. Chair, Councilmember Bender, I think um, there was certainly a proposal for funding that was much broader, but I believe what you, um, what the council did um, in the budget process was to approve the manager of administration, the creation of that FTE. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Council Vice President Jenkins. Thank you, um, Chair, and thank you, Ms. Musicant. I'm curious, what are you intending the process since it's a new position? Um, are you planning to do a search? Like, how is that going to play out? Uh, Mr. Chair, Council Member Jen Jennings, um, Jenkins, I just made up a new end to your name, sorry. Um, uh, I have done some uh, quiet recruiting just to make sure there are people that might be interested in the position, but I also expect that I will make it known that the position is available and will take um, other interested applications. So I have a quick follow up on uh, Council Vice President's question. So this is, it's an appointed position. It's appointed by the health director. It's appointed by you. Okay. Any further questions on this item? Council President. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd be happy to move this and just speak briefly about it. Um, thank you. Uh, I remember talking with you, Director, about this, as I said, during last year's budget, and I think it is a very strategic um, move for the department. As you said, we have a lot of different funding sources coming into the health department. Much of it is really leveraging a small amount of city dollars to help us receive grants or federal funding or state funding. We hope those things continue in the future in this time of uncertainty. Um, and so I see how you've really arranged this so that you're really getting a lot of administrative and financial management and strategic planning support from this position and still maintaining direct reports of the sort of core functions of the department and that service delivery um, from the department. So I think it makes a lot of sense. And um, and again, just want to comment, we're, we're going to be seeing a lot of these sort of big um, retirements from these uh, d division leader type roles, people who've been in the city for a long time. And I think it's it's helpful to see this kind of creative thinking about is do we have it structured correctly or or should we make some big changes um, when there are opportunities to do so. So I appreciate your thinking about this strategically. Thanks. Uh, so we have a motion from Council President Bender. Uh, any discussion on that motion? Uh, seeing none, all those in approval, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, say no. And that item passes. Uh, item number four is the pay equity implementation report. Uh, Mr. Bose is here to present. Thank you, Mayor Fry and committee members. Um, as we mentioned, the Local Government Pay Equity Act was enacted back in 1984, and it requires jurisdictions, political subdivisions to submit a report once every three years to the Minnesota Department of Management and Budget. It's our turn to submit our report and we have uh, prepared the report and are ready to submit that. There are three tests that we must pass on the report. The first test is called the underpayment ratio. That determines if males and females are paid comparably for the work they do that's of similar value. We use a job analysis system to fairly align the values for those positions so we can count and um, analyze the data to make sure we are in compliance. We are confident we will pass that test. The next test is the salary range test, which compares the number of years it takes for females versus males to reach the maximum salary for a particular position. We must have at least 80% to pass that test, and we are confident we will also pass that test. The third test is the exceptional service pay test, which compares the number of female classifications receiving exceptional service pay, which is called longevity pay or merit pay, to the number of male classes that receive that same pay. Again, we must pass at least 80% to, re to pass that particular test, and we are confident we will also pass that third test. As indicated above, we expect the Minnesota Department of Management and Budget to find that we also have passed that these three tests and to notify, notify us of our compliance later this year, around May or June. Pay equity rules require the governing body of our jurisdiction to review and approve the submission of the pay equity implementation report. Therefore, with your permission, 
we would like to submit that report um, next week. Thank you, Mr. Bose. Any questions for staff at the moment? Uh, seeing none, I have a quick question. Mr. Bose, you mentioned that uh, it was we had to hit a figure of 80%. It was 80% of a what? It's a score of 80% or better. Of, of what? 80% of what, though? Of uh, a comparison males to females reaching the maximum of the, the position. So that's the salary range test. So we analyze the number of males and the number of females and then take into consideration how many steps are in each bargaining unit and union contract and for the position. And then we compare how long it takes. So the female classes must achieve the range max within 80% of when the males achieve Understood. that. Understood. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Council of Vice President Jenkins. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, sir. I'm wondering, um, What are what are the goals to achieve one hundred percent pay equity? <laughs> it's a, it's a pass fail test, so the only goal is to pass, and if we have at least eighty percent, we are passing. So we obviously want to be paying fairly and competitively, but also making sure we have internal equity with the female classes versus the male classes. And what what are we determining as are we talking about job classifications or just females versus males yes vice president and, and mayor fry it is job classifications so we have about 550 job classifications that are active and we analyze the number of men versus women in each job classification and then we also take into account the number of steps it takes to get to the salary range maximum the job evaluation points from our job classification system, and then we analyze the data to make sure we're in compliance and we don't have any issues when we provide the final report uh, here in January. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council President, I'm not sure who was first. Council Member Gordon. So um, is, this, is this something we do annually? It's every three years. Every um, three years, council member. Yes. And have we reached the um, the state's eighty percent um, three years ago? We reached it okay. Uh, that's correct, uh, council member. We have passed every year, every time since nineteen eighty four. What do do we remember the percentage for last time that we passed at? Yes, we do. The uh, test we submitted three years ago for the first piece, which is the underpayment ratio, it was at eighty point nine six. This submission will be at 89.87. So that's a way to go team. That's a good thing. We like to see that. We like it at 89. We'd like it to be at 99. Um, how often do we actually do the test? Well, we'd like it to be at 100 or maybe for a few years at 120 to make up for the historic uh, you know, disparities. But <laughs> nevertheless, um, do we do the test on our own regularly to see where we're at or just we wait for every three years? Uh, uh, Mayor Fry and Council Member Gordon, we periodically update the information to get a snapshot, and make sure we're in compliance, like I mentioned, to avoid any issues. If we do identify issues, we take steps to make changes. And um, this time we have all of our union contracts settled. So that's one of the differences between three years ago and now. And we've also made some equity changes to the AFSCME general unit, and that's improved our scores as well. Okay, so I guess my next question was, are, are there issues or do we have, we identified problem, um, I don't know whether it would be classifications that are harder or comparables, and are we taking um, action to try to address those? Um, thank you, uh, Council Member Gordon. To my knowledge, we don't have any issues. We've been proactive and um, doing a, a, a very, thorough job in evaluating our positions here at the city and accurately assigning them job evaluation points like the Deputy Commissioner of Health's position. So um, this time we're very, very confident we're going to pass with flying colors, of course. And um, the other two tests, just so you have the information, we are at 87% for the salary range test and 89.62 for the third test, the exceptional service pay. 
So we often hear things like um, women make 71 cents to the dollar compared to men. Would these numbers give us any indication about how the city is doing, or would this potentially cover up something um, that it could be worse, or do we, um, how does this relate to that kind of more universal comparison about pay equity, if it right. does at all? Um, yes, Commissioner, or uh, Councilmember Gordon, the underpayment ratio test is the one that's applicable to the, the topic you're, you're mentioning, and our female job classifications are very close to what we pay the male job classifications in general. There's some job classifications that are balanced, meaning there's about the same number of men and female in those job classes. Those are moved out of the equation because they're balanced. This zooms in and focuses on the male-dominated class versus the female-dominated class, and we're right at 90%. So the females are very close to making almost identical to what the male job classes are making. Well. 90% in my field, almost identical. So we would say um, that the female employee makes 90 um, cents to the dollar compared to male employees in the city of Minneapolis? In a general way, based on job classifications. I mean, this isn't incumbent to incumbent comp comparisons. It's a general, I mean, we got, as, as we all know, there's 4,500 employees here at the, the city of Minneapolis. So um, there's a lot of data, a lot of numbers, um, but it's a, it's a way to measure in one way, are we generally compensating female job classes at least close to what the male-dominated job classes are compensated? Well, I won't, um, I won't, I won't say that that necessarily, but it, that helps me get a handle on where we're at. Um, and I think we have a little more work to do, but I'm glad that there's progress. And of course, I'm always glad when we pass the test. But maybe they could raise the bar. And I'll. Miss Pam Nell. Pam might have a something? comment. Good morning, Mayor Fry, Councilmember Gordon. Uh, this is my sixth submission of this uh, report, um, and I'd like to take an opportunity to explain to your question a little bit more about the ratio of the first test. The first test, and, and that was the one that we talked about last time, I think a little more extensively, where it was close to 80%. It was, it was passing, and that was that is the test, and that is what we were happy about at that time. As um, as a matter of fact, this test is not a percentage base. When you talk about uh, the 90 or the close to 90 score that we have now, it's actually a ratio. And the ratio is the number of male-dominated jobs above the line that's made of just male-dominated jobs versus the number of female-dominated jobs that are above or below the line, whichever way you want to look at it. So the ratio has nothing to do with the magnitude of the compensation difference. So you could have a ratio of 90% and still have the compensation be very close. And in fact, we draw a regression line, which is uh, really our own internal classification system line, and we match that line of points up to the compensation. We pay the positions within the, our city. We find that the compensation is really close, and you'll see just a, like a, a fat marker line over the heavy line with just a few exceptions of particular jobs such as perhaps IT jobs, um, some of the building trade jobs where we have to go directly to the exter uh, external market to get people to work for us um, in some of those types of jobs. So um, we have uh, by and large a very small magnitude of difference of the jobs and really the bread and butter is for us in terms of pay equity is no longer in my opinion the compensation classification question. I think we are at where we need to be, recognizing that there are some jobs we just have to pay more for talent. If it turns out to be a male incumbent at that time and it helps us or hurts us, that's just the way it is next time. It might be the other and it might be helping us or hurting us in the opposite direction. But we're balancing here the ability to attract and retain talent against the requirement that we be responsible with taxpayer dollars. So being at 100% isn't really our goal. Our goal is to pass this test and to use our own internal planning mechanism in order to achieve our internal equity goals, which is part of our compensation philosophy is to be internally equitable. And we, we look to that and we do a number of different things to make sure that we achieve that. The internal equity is achieved by using, as I was talking about, that crescent line as a planning document not referencing a document that literally throws out half of our classifications in terms of its analysis. So that line, as I said, that's like the fat marker line. Uh, it looks good. Our bread and butter is really in how we hire people. 
hiring people into jobs that were traditionally male dominated, like engineering and police officers, et cetera. Once we achieve that balance, which I would say is very good work on the HR department side, it means we're doing some things, we're making a difference in terms of our hires. And as soon as we achieve that, boom, that job just drops out of the equation. It doesn't help us, doesn't hurt us, it's just gone as far as the analysis. So personally, I think that as we continue to recruit and, and develop our workforce, that's where we need to look. It's not so much tweaking and, and worrying about whether or not uh, this, this particular test that's required by statute, what those numbers are, the importance is that we have an internal equity line, we value internal equity, and that we're achieving our goals using our own planning processes to do that. So it's, if, if I could, so it sounds like the number of classifications that are there where there's a, a disparity is getting um, smaller and smaller, if that makes any sense. Um, could we get a list of those I mean, if we're saying the police officer, um, I don't know if that classification is the right word that I'm using, but you talked about some jobs where probably in the past there was all dominated by one or another gender. And once the, that is gone, then that's taken out of the equation for this. So I'm curious about um, how many we have left where there is this um, large difference in terms of gender where maybe HRs focusing on seeing can we can we bring in more men or women into these these roles. So. Uh, Mayor Fry, Council Member Gordon, we, we've done analysis like that with classifications and as you've just seen with our earlier presentation, um, we end up moving jobs around a lot, combining jobs, taking jobs apart. There are certain industries that tend to have a higher uh, proportion of men to women in the hiring pool. Um, likewise, there's probably on the other side, similarly, some, uh, you would say, natural pool bias uh, in those jobs. I don't know that it's necessarily a goal to achieve uh, perfect balance in all of these jobs. Our goal is to get the best talent we can. But where we use the classification system to evaluate all of our jobs, it's a, it's a consistent system, no matter what the job is, if it's police <laughs> officer or it's a health commissioner or it's uh, an office support specialist too or whatever it is, we use the same criteria to evaluate all the jobs and based on that criteria, there's a predictability about what the compensation area might be. Layer on top of that, that we are under 179A required to negotiate all of our agreements and those things happen uh, not all in, in sequence or within step of one another. Uh, last time when we had the lower uh, scores, we had three uh, units as I recall that were not settled yet, that they would have carried over to the next year. When you have a full unit of jobs, particularly if it's a class or of jobs or a, a unit of jobs that would have even like female dominated jobs uh, in a higher number, you're gonna end up with more pings against you. Um, so that ratio test would be affected quite dramatically. And when everything is pretty close to the line and the margin of, or the span of difference between the jobs, that fat line marker that I was talking about, uh, it doesn't take much, just a very small amount of difference of dollars or percentage similar to what a collective bargaining difference might be, if it's 2% or whatever from year over year, uh, may be the difference between a job being above that male dominated line or below that male dominated line. So while we are required to pass this test every year, this isn't anything more than a celebration that we're in compliance with the Pay Equity Act when we get this report. Um, we would be happy to talk with you about our strategy and structure and other things to talk about how we um, value jobs, that's our classification system, and more about how uh, we may target market uh, kinds of comparisons that would include internal ex equity and where it's required external uh, market studies so that we can attract people and retain people after we get them here. And then last, uh, the influence and the effect that collective bargaining has on all of our systems pertaining to um, compensation here in the city. I appreciate that and I know that this is just one side off test and I was more um, just curious about are there still the tra traditional male dominated and female dominated jobs in the city. I think that we will see a trend line where there's less of that than there was 10, 20, 30 years ago but I was just curious about how many were left and if 99 percent of our housing inspectors are male um, you know just for my information. We don't have to talk about it more here, but that was kind of what I was was 
looking for. I think we all think that we're seeing some changes in some of those areas, but we also know that in some of the public works departments, there are probably areas and jobs that are still very male dominated. And if you look um, even in the clerk's office down the hall or something like that, you, you might say, oh, this is definitely a female dominated area. So probably HR might even be, I, you know, I see a pretty good mix, but I'm not sure. And so it's just more curious, not saying, um, you know, bad division or department do something different, but just kind of trying to keep track of those things. So we don't have to belabor this. I've dominated the conversation too okay. long. Thanks Mayor, for tolerating me. Mayor Fry, Council Member Gordon, the, uh, the uh, report that's in front of you or on your monitor available on your monitor by link, the, um, I'm trying to get the exact title of it, the uh, job class data entry verification list has some of that information that you're asking about. If you have any other questions, I'd be happy to receive a call from you and I'd be happy to talk with you further about it. Thank you very much. Uh, C.P. Bender. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I was actually just looking through this list. So in part of our packet, we have this long list of job class, it's called the job class data entry verification list. So you can see the number of males in each uh, job classification, females, and then you've coded them, female, male, or balanced, is that right? So I don't want to belabor the math um, because I think, you know, what you're hearing from the committee is we understand that we have a state test that we need to meet statutorily, right? And that's the, what you're presenting about. But also, of course, as policymakers, we're interested in actually achieving gender parity and pay equity and, of course, race equity as well in our hiring. And we've heard many times over the years from HR about how we're making progress or not toward those goals. But, um, and I guess it's important to also note that only 29% of our workforce is female and so we're already starting out with that you know we're at about a third of the people who work here are female um but so you're saying when you look through this whole list you're taking out all of the balanced job classifications is that correct and then you're you're trying to see if the female and male dominated job classifications are within a certain pay range of each other that meets 80 percent that right mayor fry uh council president bender um that's correct and point of clarification um it's not our tool uh we provide the data and the data that we will submit is in the list that you see um we were able to put a uh upload a excel document to that system that's actually owned and operated by the minnesota management and budget office and it nicely handed back to us the report that you see there that's our verification report it's that system statistical um, uh, model in and uh, uh, process that determines the class designation um, so we don't have to do that math it does it for us we merely have to count uh, the number of employees in each class and provide the minimum and maximum compensation and the points for the job um, and that's that's our role in terms of submission. So the the report that you see, we're uh, we've, we're certifying that it's accurate. We're certifying that it's complete. And uh, by using that information, we were able to by looking at the systems, uh, they have an opportunity to run a like a test drive on the results. We're confident, um, as Mr. Bose described it, that we will pass uh, at the levels uh, approximately that we that he told you of. Thank you, CVP Jenkins. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you for the report. I'm curious, though, if the report, um, if the test measures pay equity by race um, and or do we internally do that? And I'm new to the council, so I'm, I haven't heard those reports in the past. So is that involved in the test at all? Uh, Mayor Fry, Council. Uh, Vice President Jenkins. Uh, this particular uh, instrument was never designed to take a measurement uh, of anything other than male and female uh, comparisons. So uh, to the extent that I've been involved in doing compensation evaluation for pay equity, I've not done any uh, comparisons for that. Uh, I think that would be a question for um, our CHRO about what kinds of studies and evaluations are on there. But I can tell you that with our classification uh, system, it looks at the jobs, it looks at the content of jobs, it looks at the six compensable factors of the work that's performed. This is for all of our jobs. 
And uh, those six compensable factors are the knowledge that's required to get into the job, the decisions and actions of the job, what supervision uh, they may or might not have, um, the relationships that they have to have in order to be successful in their job, the effort and the working conditions. And we use those uh, very specific uh, compensable factors for all of our jobs to determine the internal value. And based on that fat marker test that even this system gives us, and our, our regression line as well gives us, I would say that uh, based on the content of the work, no matter what gender you are or what background you come from or what race, if we're using that word, um, you bring to the table uh, whatever the characteristics are. If you're on that structure, you're going to be fairly paid for the work that you've been asked to do by us. Uh, any further questions on this topic? Uh, thank you so much. Um, seeing no further questions, uh, do we have a motion to move this? Council Member Johnson has uh, has moved this item. Uh, any further discussion? All all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, say no. Uh, that completes our agenda. Uh, and seeing no further uh, business before us, uh, we are adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you.